comes in then. Good day, everyone. This is Jerry Green from the Pacific Council in Los Angeles. I want to welcome you to our, um, our event with um, my old friend and uh, colleague, uh, James Arroyo, OBE, um, which I assume stands for Order of the British Empire. Um, congratulations on that. Uh, James is the, is the director of the Ditchley Foundation, which is based in the UK, not far from, from Oxford. And in his leadership, which I had not realized has been for five years, it feels like last, last week that James um, um, became the, 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 the director of Ditchley, he has transformed Ditchley both physically and progr progr programmatically and really brought it into the 21st century in a way that, that, that's, that's quite remarkable. Ditchley has um, been in existence for 60 years um, and is a, a convening center, um, a thought leadership center um, in the UK, which brings together um, people from around the world to discuss issues of, of uh, of moment and consequence. I've been there a number of times. The Pacific Council sent a delegation uh, to Ditchley, which was a memorable experience for, for many of us. And, 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 and the work that Ditchley does is, is really, really important. It promotes the rule of law, uh, freedom, security, democracy, uh, and so forth. And what James has done uh, during his leadership has also brought it into the world of, of technology. Um, he, James himself is co-authoring a book on technology and power called The Digital Prince and the Pandemic, which is a, it's, I can't wait to read it. It is a reimagining of Machiavelli uh, for the digital age, uh, Machiavelli being a, a metaphor for, for, for power. Um, and he's co-writing with Jamie Missick, who is well known and is the CEO of Kissinger Associates. Um, James is simultaneously writing another book uh, called The Way It Is. And I am just uh, enormously impressed that he actually manages to, to, to find time to, 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 to write uh, within the context of a very, very busy life. Before taking uh, the reins at Ditchley, uh, James was the equivalent of the Chief Data and Digital Officer at the British Foreign Office. Um, he transformed the British Foreign Office as he has transformed Ditchley, um, bringing it into the world of, of AI, um, um, large data um, and, 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 and basically injecting an analytic and uh, empirical um, quality into the, into the formulation and execution of foreign policy and national security. Uh, prior to that, he was um, um, director for Europe, Latin American economic issues for the foreign office, spent four years in Paris, um, spent considerable time in the Middle East. Did you know? You think you know a guy speaks Arabic, which I didn't know, and we've been pals for a long time. But we rarely talk about the Middle East, and has served at a number of memorable places in um, in the Middle East. Um, James is a graduate of Cambridge University. He majored in English literature. So people, your kids say to you, "Why you know?" Or if you say to your kids, "Why are you majoring in English?" You can just point them in James's direction to show that. Being well-educated is a thing of great value. Um, he's married, he has two daughters, both of whom I have met at, all three of whom I have met at Ditchley, and we are delighted to, to, to welcome um, James to, to the Pacific Council. I would much prefer doing this in person. He has a standing invitation. Um, the British consulate has been invited to participate today, so I hope Emily Cloak, the British consul general is here and people in her community. I wanna welcome you. And James, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning or this afternoon or this evening. Well, thank you, Jerry. Thanks very much for that very uh, kind introduction. Um, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be talking to members of the Pacific Council. Uh, I have hugely fond memories of welcoming Jerry and the delegation here at uh, Ditchley. We had a lot of fun and um, I hope to, to do it again. And uh, Jerry has already hosted me, as he mentioned, at Los Angeles, and I hope to get back to LA before too long. Now we're all traveling again. Over to you. What I thought is James is going is, 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 is to share some thoughts with us. I will interlocute and ask him a number of questions. And then, as is our practice, the second half of the, um, of, of, um, of, of the event at, at, at half past the hour, uh, I will field questions from, from uh, 
from our members and guests who are on the call. So James, if you'll tell us what's on your mind and then I will, you know. We well, will absolutely, update. Joe. Well, we, we called this talk, um, you know, what would Charlie Wilson do? And for those who uh, don't remember or aren't familiar with him, uh, Charlie Wilson was an Amer American congressman, a, uh, a larger than life figure. So probably the first thing he would do would, would be to have a stiff drink um, as he assessed the situation. Um, but Charlie Wilson made Afghanistan his thing. And I think what he did was to see a conflict in a, you know, a place truly a long way away in every sense and understand that it, it, at its essence, it was something more than just a battle for local influence with the, uh, the Soviet empire as it was then. And he oversaw a lot of support to Afghanistan which really was material um, in defeating the Soviet Union in Afghanistan and arguably led ultimately, uh, along with other policies, to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, the golden period, as it now seems to us, uh, of, of, of Western ascendancy uh, post the fall of the Berlin War. And so the question really gets to this, you know, what do we make of the current crisis in Ukraine? Is it something that can be left to uh, the locals to sort out? How much does it matter and where this is, is heading? So I thought what I would do just to, uh, to run through some perspectives from different countries, from different angles on what this crisis means, to look ahead as to where it's going, and then to end by touching on uh, what's being done and what might need to be done and exploring um, some of the, the, the risks uh, of how this could go wrong and some of the ways in which it, it might work out. Uh, I've been on the road my, myself now, we're traveling again. Um, I was in New York recently seeing Henry Kissinger and, and others and getting perspectives from people like that. Um, I, I've been talking to people in Shanghai. We have quite interesting Chinese uh, contacts at a network in China, all of them really part of the Chinese Communist Party, um, but, but that's interesting in itself. I've just come back from Berlin um, and then uh, meetings with senior German politicians, and I was in London yesterday at number 10 and, and seeing the Polish ambassador and others. So I feel like I'm coming to you with a good sense of, of where things are, and we've indeed had contacts with the Ukrainians too and, and get a sense of that. So the, the Ukraine perspective, I mean, Ukraine, they didn't quite believe that this was going to happen at the final moment. But luckily, they, 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 they knew that Russia would be back post-2014, post-Crimea, when Russia had taken the Crimean Peninsula. And by, by almost by stealth at that point, more of a hybrid operation than a, a, an open invasion. And they'd used the time quite well to prepare. Um, the intelligence, as you probably know, predicted the correctly that there would be a full invasion. So again, there was a sense of preparation there. But nonetheless, the people were taken by surprise, including President Zelensky, when the Russians roll in. But then Putin himself was then dealt up with a, another surprise, which was that the Russian army was not as well prepared and not as effective as he thought he was. And Ukrainian response, the Ukrainian response was much stronger. I, I think it's worthwhile pausing and saying what would have happened, it, what could have happened if the plan had worked. The plan, it, it seems pretty clear, was that uh, they would, you know, amass an overwhelming force. They would make it clear they were targeting Zelensky. He would flee. Um, they'd get to Kiev quite quickly. There would be confusion. They would install some puppet. Um, and then that person would declare Ukraine liberated. Um, and Russia would sort of you know, hold the, the country. And then we'd all be reacting you know, to what had happened within a few days. That's what happened. And instead, of course, they got bogged down very quickly by ferocious, well-supported, um, well-targeted Ukrainian resistance. And they've moved on to plan B, which was to, they moved quickly onto plan B, which was to grind the country down, uh, to deploy artillery, to, uh, bombard cities um, to show they were prepared to do whatever it took uh, to force the Ukrainians to call for 
uh, piece, and they haven't done so. And the reason they haven't done so is because they don't believe that it will stop anytime soon. They think that they, the Russia wants the whole country, doesn't believe in Ukraine as a country, and it's an existential fight for them. Um, and the Russians, again, I think, got that wrong. They, they didn't believe their own intelligence, their own reporting. And now they've got a, a population against them who at the moment, despite the terrible losses and the, the, the atrocities, are you know, 90% convinced they can win. And believing you can win is one of the most important things, I think, in warfare, whether it's a traditional war or an insurgency. And they believe they can win if they get enough weapons. That's crucially important when you're fighting in cities. You need courage to kind of go in down streets, into buildings. Um, and uh, the Ukrainians have clearly got the edge on that for both morale reasons and for technical reasons in terms of rifles they've got and the weapons that are being supplied. I guess where we now are, though, is Plan C, which is what Russia intends to do. Is it, It's revised its war aims. And what they're determined to do, turning to the Russian perspective, is to deliver a victory. Victory means they take um, a chunk of eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine. If they do that, they get the ports, but they also get most of the agricultural areas. And they'll leave Ukraine really much less viable as a country. Um, I think we're going to move into a pretty even more pitiless, even more cruel, um, dangerous and damaging uh, period of the war, because the Ukrainians know what comes next. You know, country is no longer viable. Um, defense is no longer so viable. And for the Russians, um, they actually don't care, I believe, about having the people. So the Ukrainians are calling for people to get out to save themselves, to, you know, to, to escape the inevitable suffering that's coming. I think the Russians are quite happy to see Ukrainians head west. They've given their, washed their hands of them. They want the territory, they want the territorial victory uh, for President Putin, rather than as they thought, the sort of liberation of Russian speaking Ukrainians. Um, so that's what we're, we're going to, to see. Um, Europe, they, uh, people have reported a lot about Germany's transformation. Germany is transformed, but it's halfway there. It's kind of 50-50. Um, they, they have immediate defense uh, plans to spend more money, um, but they need to address the longer term. There's still quite a lot of German uh, politicians who would like to see negotiations and ceasefire sometime soon. And European unity will be tested if and when Russia does call for a ceasefire after it's achieved its revised war aims. On the uh, oil, embar oil and gas embargo, they've done coal now in response to the atrocities, then gas is obviously the most uh, difficult. That's not just because it, of heating um, and, and energy in that sense, it's because gas is a crucial ingredient for the German chemical industry. So no gas, the factories have to stop, the workers have to be furloughed, Either the state sets, uh, steps in, or they they go on to employ, unemployment. Um, there will be a there will be a European wide recession, damaging the global economy. So that's a, a big deal. But that's where the the debate in is in Germany at the moment. How quickly can they get off Russian gas onto something else? Um, people are encouraging them. I think not pressuring them because they, we understand it's difficult. But that is a, a big decision that would have a, a major impact. China is, is interesting. Um, China was clearly complicit in, this, in the original plan. Um, take Kiev quickly, install a puppet, put a you know, finger in the eye of NATO and the Americans, um, strengthen the, the Russian uh, front. Um, China, I think, probably saw value in that and, and, and believed it, uh, it seems. Uh, they've been discomforted by the failure of the plan. It doesn't make authoritarianism look effective or good. They're discomforted, I think, by the revelation of the atrocities. Uh, but they will carry on, um, as the Chinese say, speaking out, both, out, out of both sides of their mouth. They will call for peace, but they won't do anything really to bring it about. 
um, they will express concern about atrocities, but they won't condemn. And they will probably wait and see what happens over the next um, three to four months. Um, the the um, uh, the the hawks in China see this as still quite good. They they want the U.S. tied up in Europe. They want the U.S. distracted from the Indo-Pacific and direct strategic competition with China. They think that anything they do to anger the U.S. is going to happen anyway. So they may as well uh, take the win with Russia. Um, that they they're, they're watching American politics and they believe that sort of further confrontational acts towards China are coming. So why not uh, take this benefit? I'm looking at the U.S. I'm not, I, and I'm saying to people like the Chinese, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, the Biden administration clearly didn't want you know, uh, war in Europe, um, but now it has been forced upon us, there are some advantages. First of all, it makes authoritarianism look really bad, at least for a Western audience. Um, you know, there's, a, there's been a lot of criticism of the ugly scenes in Western politics, of the polarization in the US, um, riots, um, all of that pales into insignificance compared to destroyed cities and murdered civilians. Uh, in Ukraine right now, and the repression that we're seeing in Russia really beginning to, to bite, uh, and the restrictions of freedom of speech. So I think that that sort of fundamentally is, is an advantage to the West, that uh, Putin has pulled off the mask, shown what he has become, if he wasn't before, and now we're under no illusions. And there is this question about where is China going, which, you know, hawks are are already talking about what does it say about the nature of authoritarianism, if this is where we end up uh, with Russia. Um, for the US as well, US, the US has been trying to persuade Europe to spend more on defense and to do more on the Eastern flank. Europe will spend more on defense. That's all, already been the case in Germany. Uh, Poland is spending 3%. Uh, we're gonna see a strong commitment to defense. Uh, certainly in the UK, that will continue and I think across Europe. So that angle is, 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 is I think, good. Um, less reliance on um, uh, the uh, Russian power uh, exports for Europe uh, means more markets for American LNG, uh, for example. So there's actually some economic benefit there. And America's not fighting in the war, there are gonna be no casualties, at least as long as it remains within bounds. The, the risks, of course, are escalation. Um, as we get longer into this war, the, the risks of the Ukrainians overreaching grow as they get angrier, more tired, um, and the risk that there's, it will be understandable that they might do something which could really take us into an escalatory territory. Um, the frontline states like Poland are nervous about where this is going. Um, and have to believe very strongly in American security guarantees, I think, to, to hold back. Otherwise, why wouldn't you want to try and push the Russians back now while they're uh, you know, set off balance? So I think that there are serious risks here. Putin is obviously gesturing towards tactical nuclear weapons. Um, I don't think he has any plans to do that. But at the same time, he's turned what was a war of choice into a war of survival for him and his regime, I think. So he can't afford to lose. Both sides are sort of dangerous there. Both ways this could work out are, are dangerous. Um, we, if, if it goes well for the Russians, well in the sense that they get their territory, um, China will be watching and the limits of Western support and Western power therefore will have been exposed. We're not willing to fight. We're worried about nuclear escalation. Um, we've tried all we can by supplying the Ukrainians, but it wasn't enough. And Putin has taken that. Of course, his economy will be wrecked. He'll be much more dependent on China, but he'll get, have some new resources of income as well. And China will step in to support because they can't, they, they, they won't accept that Putin will fail, I think, at the end of the day. Um, if it goes our way, if our support for the Ukrainians um, is effective, if Putin is pushed back, then the question will be, where do they stop? 
do they take just the territories taken now, or do they try and take Crimea and roll into the Russian speaking provinces they've been controlling for some years as well? And that again could sort of tip into to dangerous um, territory. That said, so, so what do we do? We, we, we need to keep the, what would Charlie Wilson do? We need to keep the flow of weapons going. And we need to gauge carefully that we don't push over the edge into escalation. Um, but we need to match Ukrainian courage with the appropriate weapons uh, to win the war, or at least to uh, prevent Putin getting the kind of victory he wants and making Ukraine a non-viable state. The information war and talking to an LA uh, crowd, um, I think, to an LA group, that this is, 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 is important. Um, the information war is effective in Ukraine and in the West um, at present. Uh, you know, we, we can all see what's happening. It's not effective in Russia, where state control of the media is still powerful. And most importantly, it's, well, equally importantly, I think, it's not effective in India, Brazil, or large parts of Africa. There's a, there's a struggle to get the story out and to explain really what is happening that we really need to give a lot of attention to. And then I think the energy angle and allowing Europe to take a really tough stand, stance on energy, enabling Europe to do that, getting LNG to Europe more quickly um, is, is really important in increasing the pressure on Russia. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, this, this, we didn't choose this. Um, it's revealed things about Putin we, we sort of half knew. Um, but the die is cast now, and it can't, it isn't just about Russia. It's about Russia and China. And therefore, I think it has to be of vital strategic interest to the United States, as well as to those of us here in Europe. James, thank you so much. Um, I've, I've got a few questions and then um, all of our members and guests can pose your questions and I will, I will pose them for you to, to James. But the first question many, many Americans are asking is could, not, could we not, when I say we, the West, NATO and the US, not do more uh, for Ukraine? Um, people were very taken when, uh, when Zelensky said, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. And um, that's you know one of those Churchillian phrases that people are not going to uh, soon forget. And you know the conventional wisdom as well. If we contribute to a no-fly zone, this will lead you know it'll lead to a, a casualty. This will lead to the invocation of Article Five. An attack on one is an attack on all. This will lead to war um, with Russia. Um, is there a middle ground between war with Russia? and what we are doing now. I was hearing yesterday a certain type of uh, uh, drone is being sent to Ukraine, and I, I don't know a lot about it, but I thought, you know, what took so long? Why, why couldn't we have done this sooner? So I, I wonder if, if, if there's not more that could be done even now, because time is, is very, very precious and costly to the Ukrainians. The country is just being destroyed, and as we both know, Refugees don't always go home and don't always go home very quickly. And there's not much to go home to in certain parts of, 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 of Ukraine. Well, just on the last point, I mean, I think we're going to see truly huge uh, numbers of people on the move um, as the next phase of the war comes through. And that's what I mean by they're not interested in the people. So that's going to become much of a uh, much greater issue for, for Europe. Um, it, it's a really good question, Jerry. I mean, as to what is the, the limit? And the problem with the question is that th there's no objective answer. It's whatever Vladimir Putin thinks. That's right. And I, I think the, the, the bottom line is, you know, he has uh, decided that he is Russia's destiny, Russia is his destiny. And if he thinks that's not going to work, then all bets are off, you know, um, if he thinks and and he you know, these things don't end well in authoritarian regimes. Sure. So if he thinks he could end up against a wall like Ceausescu did in Romania, then um, he might choose to escalate further as a way out of this. 
at the moment, I think, although that I think that the, the sort of state propaganda in Russia is holding, as far as I can see, uh, for a significant part of the population, I don't think it's really Russia's war, it's still Putin's war. He will try and make it um, Putin, uh, Russia's war. And there are there is a sort of line of argument that actually he'd quite like it to be a fight with NATO. Um, because losing a fight with NATO or being Russia fighting against NATO is, uh, you know, if he's pushed back, it's because of the forces of NATO arrayed against Russia. It's giant against giant. It's not humiliating like um, uh, losing to Ukraine supplied by some Russian weapons. Um, but I think we get into a dis difficult situation. I, 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 where, you know, where to draw the line, it's, 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 it's just a finger in the air because it's just down to one man as to what he thinks is, is necessary, uh, what, what, is, you know, what, what will lead to his defeat. That's what, that's what will tip him over. The other angle to say is it's partly about the weapons. You know, if, you give them, if you give the Ukrainians MiG-29s, as um, nearly happened, um, then what do the Ukrainians do with them? If they use them to, um, to, to, you know, to, defect, to hit artillery outside Mariupol, that's one thing. If they use them to go across the border into Russia and strike um, fuel depots there, or materiel or ammunition dumps or whatever it is in Russia, then that, that's there. And that it also it all increases the chances of, of miscalculation. I think though this is going to be tested in the coming weeks, otherwise the Ukrainians are just going to lose. So we're just going to have to try and um, do as much as we dare uh, and as much as we can. And it's cold comfort. People often say, well, Putin may win the battle and lose the war, which, you know, he will achieve some objective in Ukraine. But but there's also a self-fulfilling prophecy quality to what he's doing. Finland and Sweden are talking about joining NATO. Um, Switzerland, you know, um, uh, abandons its, its time-honored neutrality. Um, and, and on and on and on. So, but having said this, so, so you know, it's, it's, it, NATO will certainly move, preposition things far closer to the Russian border. There may be more NATO members, but, you know, tell this to the poor Ukrainians um, who will, I think I agree with you, inevitably lose a portion of their country. You know, the Russian speaking areas are likely to be held by, by Russia. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's cold comfort. Um, the other question, and, and, and again, is, is um, what have we learned about warfare here? In other words, it, to sort of look at the, the way in which the war is being conducted. And, and, and it is said that the Ukrainians are using um, all sorts of high-tech means very, very effectively you know, opposing the Russian army, which is populated by poorly trained, poorly supplied, um, grossly inadequate conscripts. So um, it's, it's, it's sort of, a, a, given it's the first major land war in Europe since World War II, it looks different than wars to which we are accustomed. Um, what, have we, what have we learned? Because you're the, the, the sort of high tech guy. What are you thinking about when you look at this? Well, so start just something you didn't mention, which is cyber. So everyone thought that Russia would you know, wage a cyber war. Um, and I, as to my understanding is that, you know, they have been trying to launch cyber attacks against the, the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are getting a lot of help. And I think one of the interesting and actually encouraging things is that when we know what we need to protect, um, you know, we in the broad sense, um, in the sense in Ukrainian capabilities, then actually that's been quite successful. Uh, the Russians haven't been able to bring things down. They've needed some aspects of it. They haven't been able to bring others down. So I think our problem is trying to defend everything at all times against kind of Russian or Chinese attacks, um, almost not random, but you know, an act of surprise on some company here, some company there. If you know you're trying to protect Ukrainian networks, uh, then you've got a reasonable chance of doing it. And also what's been interesting is for all of the talk about um, you know, risks of escalation, the Russians haven't done things they could do against Western companies in response to sanctions for fear of escalation. That's the only explanation. 
uh, I would say, because we haven't seen that. So I think the cyber thing is interesting. It's kind of, um, you know, showing we can defend some stuff when we really need to, in, in, in my view. Um, on the, the nature of warfare, really um, interesting is the, the way that, you know, there's this been this mega trend of, it was starting with the Maginot line of, you know, build big fortifications, castles, which used to be uh, an advantage. And gradually they've been outpaced by technology. And now what we're seeing, you know, the concept of a tank, which in, in some ways is kind of, you know, a moving castle, you know, big, heavy, slow moving thing, powerfully armed. A tank has to be protected now to uh, a large extent. It's like, you know, aircraft carriers and uh, uh, on the sea, um, on the ocean, aircraft carriers and destroyers. They need their own protection. They need a battle group around them to try and protect them. And so tanks, I think we're now seeing this coming now to the level of the tank. And, you know, we always thought that those weapons would be effective. That people were told against um, Soviet armor. It turns out that they are effective. Um, and um, the, the, the other angle, as you touched on, is the, the merger of civilian and military technology, which, again, people have been talking about, you know, drones, developing military drones is, is, is a challenge, you know, because people want to be, they want them to be robust and all the things that military equipment has. But actually, uh, to a certain extent, you know, a, a cheap commercial drone, a couple of thousand dollars with carrying some explosives is quite effective. Um, and being able to, to do that, and also effective for reconnaissance. And I think we've seen how important intelligence is in being able to target um, attacks and, and make them have real, um, uh, real impact. You know, you, you can't be everywhere, but if you can choose carefully where you're going to be, you can cause real problems by, by careful analysis and intelligence and targeting. The other piece of it that I need that we didn't really mention is is intelligence and the United States uh, before the in the ramp up to the war actually used intelligence um, in, 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 in new and creative and it turned out um, rather wise ways in that um, rather than obsessively hoarding secrets, most of which aren't that secret to begin with anyway. Um, they actually broadcast um, much of what they knew, you know, presumably protecting sources and methods. And it sort of undercut the Russians a little bit because the truth, um, you know, properly deployed can be a powerful, a powerful weapon. So that was something interesting that's very, very different. I, um, which again, I'm sure the intelligence community is on one hand a little concerned that they're, you know, secrets are being revealed, but on the other hand, is probably really pleased that it, it makes such a, it makes such a, a significant, uh, it makes such a significant difference. Another question is about economic sanctions, which always sound better and more powerful um, and more compelling than they are. Um, economic sanctions, wherever there's a sanction, there's a leak, inevitably. I mean, this is, you know, perhaps, uh, uh, an application of markets that uh, Milton Friedman had never really thought about, although, you know, if he would hear, he probably would have figured it out very, very quickly. But what you said about Germany, they're only halfway there. They're only halfway there. And uh, you were just in Berlin. Is there a vigorous debate? Is there dissent uh, that Germany's not father there? Or is there sort of a, a belief that Germany is doing, Germany's primary interests are, is Germany's national interest, not the European experience writ large? No, I think there's a, a, a really vigorous debate. Um, as uh, someone uh, who's an American in one of my conversations kind of summed it up rather well, um, she said that um, the era where Germany could take cheap energy from Russia use it to make um, expensive products that it sold to China and then benefit from the American security umbrella, that's over. Um, and when I say that to Germans, they go, yep, that's well said, but that's Germany. Um, that's been you know, the, the core of, 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 of what Germany has done economically, arguably. Um, I think the other sort of like thing for them and what I found in Berlin is you know, modern Germany 
was self-consciously founded on a rejection of the, you know, the irrational ambitions of national socialism. Um, and, um, you know, there's a strong belief in reason. And so they, they just can't quite believe that Putin is doing something. Some Germans can't quite believe that Putin is doing something which is so evidently not in the economic interests of the Russian people or indeed his own regime or indeed himself. Um, and they can't believe that he's choosing this warped version of history instead, but, but he is. And so I think there's a kind of like psychological challenge for people to get over that the world has changed. And um, you know, all of the arguments that Germany was making about engaging Russia, which was that this is not just about the economics, um, you know, engaging Russia in mutually beneficial energy contracts is a security act. All of that has been proven just completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's a major reassessment going on. On the debate at the moment, the, the latest thing was the current defense minister calling for you know, an embargo on gas uh, and saying we need to do that. Um, the, the, the gas is the difficult bit. It will cause um, serious economic challenges in Germany. Um, I think the debate will continue. And I think where it will end up will be probably uh, across Europe, because it's not just Germany that's reliant, a, um, a, 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 a gradual reduction. You know, it'll, it'll take some time, but they'll, they'll try and push it through as quickly as they can. It'll, it'll settle down in, in some sort of time period. On sanctions, Jerry, I think the other thing which people are talking about a lot, I don't know if you've, you've been talking about it at the Pacific Council, is the precedent setting nature of the uh, the, the sanctions on uh, national reserves, on central bank reserves. And what people see there is, is a kind of big shift in the global financial system, because it means you, you know, you, you don't fiat currency, a currency you support as a state is no longer uh, sacrosanct, that, that they're attacking the currency, which is why the Russians want to be paid in rubles um, to, to try and strengthen the currency. So, you know, the, that's going to have big implications. I mean, China holds a lot of um, government bo uh, of treasury bonds from the US, as you know, a huge amount. Um, but to, su to sustain its own, you know, as its own reserve, um, they're going to be thinking about that. And they're going to want to divest from it gradually. They can't do it too quickly. So there will be big changes from these sanctions in terms of the global financial system as well. Um, I was watching this morning a live stream of um, uh, confirmation hearings in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for four ambassadors, one of whom is the former chair of our board who has been nominated to be ambassador uh, to Norway, Mark Nathanson. And uh, the other three candidates were for South Korea, Australia, and um, let's see, what was the other one? It was uh, South Korea, Australia, and the Philippines. And what was interesting to me is how few questions there were about Norway, which does share a, you know, a border with Russia, and all of the questions about, about China. And you can see from an American policy perspective, this is one of these, these, um, these hurricanes that, you know, these tornadoes that came out of nowhere that the United States really wishes it doesn't have to deal with because it's much more concerned with, uh, um, with, with China. And with China, you know, you can talk about the AUKUS deal with the Australians, you can talk about the Quad, there's a lot, a lot going on there. But this is clearly um, a metaphor for China, Taiwan. So I, I'd, I'd be very interested, what do you hear from your colleagues in Shanghai? Nobody believes that the Chinese army would, would, uh, um, would, would, would perform with the criminal incompetence of the Russian army. Um, it's, it's, it's a very different um, situation, but one that's, that's, that's difficult to ignore. Even emotionally, thinking about a two-front war is very difficult. Fighting one is almost unimaginable. But um, what, 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 you know, what has changed in the world vis-a-vis -vis China, Taiwan, as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? I, I think it's, it's broadly good for the West. Um, at the moment, I mean, I think, yeah, the, the Chinese would perform better, or would certainly want to plan better. But this has shown that these things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, 
the uh, that a lot depends upon people's willingness to fight and the as well as the weapons they have. So I think that's one angle. I think both the Russians and the Chinese, I imagine, have been surprised by the speed and strength of the reaction. Certainly, they've been surprised by Europe um, and Europe's willingness to shift um, on this. And the the Chinese were reaching out a while back to see if there might be any kind of daylight with Europe and the US um, if China were to take a tougher stance on uh, Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's just unlikely. I mean, I think it strengthened the, the Western alliance in that sense. So I think that's good. Um, and the Chinese, again, I mean, I think sort of China moving on Taiwan has probably been put back rather than brought forward is, is my, my overall mm -hmm. feeling. On the, the negative side, um, you know, we, we're seeing the world, uh, you know, there's uh, more than half the world, you know, is not really on our side on this. That's right. Um, India is, uh, dis you know, despite its antipathy for China, India is kind of firmly supportive of Russia, uh, I would say. And that runs through the entire Indian political class. Um, you know, Brazil, um, there's support for Russia and, you know, disinterest from the, the West. Middle East, uh, they see, they point to the kind of hypocrisy on Yemen. You know, look at the suffering of Yemen, nothing done. These people look like you, you do everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's quite, a, Africa, it's kind of split where China is strong, then, uh, you know, condemnation is weak. So actually, it's not so comforting for us from that perspective in terms of, that's why I said on the information campaign that there's a, a huge amount to do because it's not that comforting there. Um, you know, we're all, you know, I think, completely rightly outraged and uh, appalled. Others just sort of look at it and go, well, now it's just you, but this has been going on forever. Um, I'm going to turn to to, to um, questions from our members. Is um, uh, Professor A. Wagner just sent an interesting note that he has a piece coming out on Russia, Russia's cyber capabilities in the Wall Street Journal in the coming days. Um, so uh, uh, Abe not only does political analysis, but he's a real scientist, unlike many political scientists of which I am one, in which the S is a <laughs> lot smaller than it is for for Dr. Wagner. So I'm going to have everybody keep their eyes open for it. Another question comes from uh, Madeline Bilderu, and, and, and she has, it's a very interesting question, which is, um, on one hand, um, what happens if there's some sort of ceasefire that leads to an unsettled peace versus this, this, this sort of this, this conflict gets frozen and it goes on and on? Forever and 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 so she's she's I'm I'm speaking for her so I may get this 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 wrong but it it it's the question is what what could outcomes look like um what are, what are, what are, what what's the best possible outcome for this uh, not only for the Ukraine but also for uh, for Europe because this is the beginning of a uh, we're in for the long haul here this wars don't end in seven weeks uh, or two months or whatever it is, and it's really, really uncertain um, where this is likely to, to go. Um, well, good question, Madeline. I, I think the, the best possible outcome would be um, continued military stalemate. The best possible outcome for you know, the broader world would be, the world would be that, that the Russians fail to, um, achieve their aims um, but that you know we don't push it to the point of regime collapse and it doesn't get out of hand and doesn't escalate and I think what that would sort of look like would be relatively small Russian gains um, and, and, and uh, the, the, the risk is that it sort of goes one way or another the Russians take much more or you know, Ukraine drives Russia out of, of, of Crimea um, with Western support. And then I think we get closer to that point of you know, when, do we, when are we actually at war? When does Russia decide that it doesn't matter? Um, we are at war with the West and what can we do? 
um, to, to push this. Um, but I think a kind of like stalemate with, with um, an eventual kind of uneasy ceasefire, which is pretty much what has been the case uh, for the last few years, um, is, is there, uh, is, is, is the, probably the best possible outcome, which is not great. And then what we then see is kind of military buildup on both sides. The Russians will try and um, remedy the, you know, the failings of their army and their equipment and, and improve that uh, learning uh, from what went wrong. And, you know, we will build up uh, the Ukrainians, um, not in NATO, but uh, out there. I, I, it's very hard to see, I think, at the moment, a negotiated outcome that, that Ukraine would sign up to. Um, I just think, you know, why would they, what would that mean? Ceasefire, yeah, but, um, you know, neutrality, um, well, armed neutrality, yes, but again, security guarantees. So what's the difference between that and NATO? Um, that's kind of Sweden. I, I think the, the, you know, the, the, the bad outcomes, you can kind of go as high as you like. Right, right. Um, it's, 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 it's tragedy on a rheostat, and the question is, you know, um, how 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 far will it go? Uh, Richard Walden, who runs an NGO, um, just sent an interesting comment that I I share. I hadn't heard this, but it doesn't surprise me. And he 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 says that Sean Penn um, recently um, suggested that his not for profit, I don't know what it's called, would be willing to accept lethal weapons as donations to pass on to. Uh, uh, the Ukrainians, and he is advocating that billionaires buy weapons to, you know, to channel to the Ukraine. So um, what Richard, I, I'm sure, is thinking <laughs> and says is, you know, that doesn't do much for the not-for-profit world. You know, it's it's the last thing you want to do is to is to um, make humanitarian organizations persona non grata in the countries where their work is most needed because of Sean Penn's, you know, idea, which um, I hadn't heard it, but it's certainly interesting. The next is a question from, from Richard, uh, from Alex Barker, which is interesting. Um, what he's saying is, is once this is, the war is over, what, no matter how it turns out, um, Ukraine is gonna re require massive support uh, to rebuild. And if, if neutrality is part of the agreement, and, and it forswores a willingness to, to, to uh, join NATO, which Zelensky has already said that, you know, Ukraine joining NATO is off the table. Does that hold true for the EU as well? In other words, can, can uh, you're a European, I'm not. So I'm just curious, can, um, you know, could Ukraine join the European Union and still be considered neutral by by Russia, because the EU piece of it might answer part of Alex Barker's question, which is to, you know, to, to rebuild Ukraine, which, you know, which, which uh, moves the border even farther east and closer to Russia. Um, well, again, we don't know what the Russians would do because it comes down to one man's view mm -hmm. um, on, on, on the question of the European Union. But I think the, the logic, Alex, behind your question is right, which is that joining the EU is something Ukraine says it wants, right. but it's it's very close to being in NATO. Um, you know, being an e the EU treaty actually has a very strong kind of mutual support uh, guarantees um, in terms of the, the EU itself, even though the EU doesn't have military competences and it's left to the nations. That's part of the treaty, which people um, forget. I think it's uh, likely, though, that you know that, that people will the, the can, uh, people will want to kind of take Ukrainian candidacy seriously, uh, and I think that's quite likely. And people are talking about that in Germany and kind of making that a, a, a proper process, but that it will take a long time. Um, that they, I don't think people are willing to fast forward, um, you know, to take. Uh, a country like Ukraine torn by war with existing problems of corruption and the like straight into the EU just uh, as, 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 as kind of compensation for NATO or as a, a sort of salve for the terrible suffering of the country. Um, the question as to how Ukraine gets rebuilt um, is, is, you know, though I think is going to be with you know, EU aid. People will want to do that. I'm sure that'll be part of it. There's also the question of those Russian reserves, though, coming back to that. 
um, and what the legality of sort of just they've been frozen, um, you know, taking them and uh, and using that to to kind of rebuild Ukraine. Um, you know, I always say joining the EU is not like applying to college. Um, you know, you you apply in the fall and you get you, you get in in April. It's it's a, it's, a, it's it's almost as hard as getting out of the EU, which is a uh, <laughs> we know about that whole other conversation, which we will we will uh, save for another save for another day. But um, I I wonder um, also domestically what does this mean. For Putin, I mean, Russia is two countries. One country is St. Petersburg and Moscow, um, and then there's Russia, which is which is is very different than than these two sparkling urban centers, which people assume is 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 the whole country. And um, you know, the part we hear a lot about is very courageous people like Alexander Navalny, who was just you know mind-bogglingly brave. I I can't imagine uh, what he does and what he goes through. Um, and then, you know, we, we certainly hear a lot about dissent here because that's of interest to us and it's sort of, it's a narrative we like. Um, but I really wonder over the long run, is this, is this going to help um, Putin or is it going to hurt him? Logically, it should hurt him. Um, but, but there are lots of authoritarian countries, there are lots of countries that are subject to economic um, embargoes and, and, and other sorts of things. Where actually they don't achieve their ends, um, you know, it's 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 sort of Russian pride. You know, the worst thing that ever happened in Vladimir Putin's life was the you know the fall of the Soviet Union, versus the quality of life and democracy and a viable economy and so forth. So, what do we think this is going to look like? There's something very symbolic when you see Putin sitting a hundred yards away from his closest advisors in a meeting. Which you know sort of says hypersensitivity to COVID, or he's afraid somebody's going to take him out. Um, so I and, and I don't you know I don't have the answer to that. But what is this going to do to Putin domestically? It could help him. It could hurt him. Or you know life could continue as it has for hundreds of years in Russia. Um, quite a lot of Russian experts I know think this is the beginning of the end for him. Mm -hmm. This you know this was a mistake from the start when when Plan A didn't work. It's going to be the equivalent of Afghanistan. Right. It might take some years, but in the end, it, you know, it will result in him being at least um, severely weakened. Um, I think he's certainly going to be more reliant on China. So the the Vladimir Putin, who was um, you know an equal with Xi because uh, of their military prowess and their his ability to poke the West in the eye, that has been damaged. Um, if China, China uh, um, will take the energy, you know, cheap energy, it has a limitless need for cheap energy and it will build the infrastructure because they have to build pipelines in the other direction and new terminals, et cetera, et cetera, but they'll take the energy, but they will pay less for it. So Russia is gonna be a lot poorer um, at the end of the day as this works through. Um, the so he is going to be weakened, I think, objectively. Um, if he doesn't deliver a victory, I think that's worse. That um, he will be, to some extent, humiliated. And, you know, the, the coverage of, uh, they can't keep the, the coverage of, of Russian defeats and the burnt out tanks and all of those dead soldiers um, off the media forever or, or out of people's minds forever. So I think that will, will have a, a, an impact. I'm very doubtful though, that um, people will be able to get to Putin in the sense of, of, of bring him down or um, you know, deliver him for trial or, or more likely um, kill him. Um, I think they're very, you know, czars are very well, have all, as you implied, Jerry, have always been well protected. And the system is kind of locked in to do that. But it's possible that he could be kind of severely weakened and sort of lives out his days a bit more in uh, Lukashenko style, you know, rather than lording it around the stage. He can't, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, as President Biden has said, you know, he's now internationally branded a war criminal. And, you know, can he ever go anywhere again? Um, can he ever leave Russia? It seems unlikely. I mean, to China, are the Chinese going to want to stand aside in? 
alongside him. I'm, I'm sort of more doubtful about that as well. So I don't know if he's gone, he's definitely weakened. Um, I, I think the risk is, is we turn it into a Russian war and then uh, Russian patriotism gets uh, activated seriously. And then I think um, he will say, I told you so, uh, you know, we got in there first, but this is what they planned. And Russians will choose greatness and resistance as they always have over um, their economic interests. Although being China's partner, junior partner, junior is the key part of that formulation, will be endlessly galling um, to Putin because that means that, you know, Beijing will, will say jump and he'll have to say how high. And, you know, it's the very antithesis of what he had hoped to achieve. Victories can be manufactured. Countries do it all the time. You know, you you you, you know, it's it's you, you lost and you say you won and you you know people love to you know believe what they're told. So you know if they can keep on to you know if they hold on to some of the Russian speaking you know portions of Ukraine, or I think Sudetenland, um, you know, and we've we've liberated our Russian speaking brethren from the genocide visited on them, but from key, blah, 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 blah. You know, we've won, we've achieved our objectives and we're going home. That part I could see him doing, but it's sort of a special kind of hell for a guy like him uh, to have to do um, Beijing's bidding and, and really not to have nearly the influence on Beijing um, that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that he would think. I mean, it's, it's the opposite of what he was hoping to achieve. Uh, James, well, we're I, gonna, I hope ahead. so. I hope it is. I hope it is a special word. kind of hell. Sorry. <laughs> I hope it is a special kind of hell. Me too. Me too. Yeah. 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 I think it deserves it. I mean, I, I, so I, I think there's um, a tricky balance for us. We need to defeat him um, if we possibly can. I think that's an American interest, in British interest, in European interests, uh, more broadly in terms of democracy versus authoritarianism. Um, our risk is there's two risks. One is we fail. And actually at the end of the day, he gets to claim a victory and China takes note that, yeah, it was messy, it was badly done, but hey, look, they, they ended up with what they wanted. I think that's a bad message. And then the other flip side risk is that uh, we succeed a bit too much and angry Ukrainians take it too far. And then we, we end up into a kind of real war of existence with Vladimir Putin, huh. which is not a great thought. Huh. Um, so I think you know that that's that's the kind of, of risk where you're right the um, opposition to him grows, and you know he and his family are facing uh, potential you know <laughs> uh, trial uh, execution. Um, these things don't end well. So I, I I think if if you haven't seen it, I recommend the death of Stalin as a as a great production as to how these things can end. Yeah, yeah. And Charlie Wilson's War, um, highly recommended to everybody to see what somebody who believes in something can, can accomplish. James, thank you so much for doing this. I, I really would like to, let's do this next time in person in Los Angeles. Um, I'm most grateful to our members. I wanna thank you for joining us. And I wanna invite all of you to our annual dinner on May 2nd, um, in Los Angeles at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Our guest speaker is going to be Nabi Bulos, who is the Los Angeles Times for, foreign correspondent who is um, reporting from Ukraine and will be traveling from Ukraine uh, to Los Angeles to address us. His prior post was in Afghanistan, where he was at Kabul airport, um, you know, more than, more than uh, I imagine he'll ever uh, forget and was actually um, attacked by the Taliban. So he's a very, I know Nabi really well, and he's a very interesting person. So he'll give us sort of a firsthand assessment. James, all best to you and to Ditchley and, and to your family. Thank you for joining us, members. Thank you. And Valerie, who made all of this happen. I forgot to thank the most important person, which is, who was Valerie. Valerie, thank you so much. Take care and everybody have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Bye now. Bye.